Amen. Well, guys, uh, very, very quick uh, update and announcement here. For leaders meeting, we'll keep it the same time, 2.30 p.m., yes. but we're still going to do Zoom. Oh, so okay. just to uh, re-announce that right well, there. It's going to be an awesome time at leaders meeting. Yeah. With that said, guys, we're going to continue now our Summer in the Sun Woo! series. Yes. Wow. And uh, for those who are new, who are guests with us this morning, we have been sitting out the book of Hebrews. Yeah. And uh, today we will be diving into Hebrews chapter 9. Wow. Let's turn there. On, and as we're turning there, I do want to give us a quick uh, summary once again awesome. on the book of Hebrews. We understand that uh, the book of Hebrews, the author, is unknown. But as disciples of Christ, we have a deep conviction that it is the Holy Spirit that wrote the book of Hebrews, no matter who the vessel may have been. And uh, the book of Hebrews is addressing the Hebrew Christians who are wanting to leave the faith. They're wanting to return back to Judaism, back to their old religion. The reason being is because they're experiencing heavy persecution and hatred by the, the, the Roman people of that time. Wow. It's believed that Emperor Nero used the Christians as a scapegoat to extend his palace as he burnt down a lot of homes and fields. Yeah. Um, and so now the Christians are taking a lot of the, the heat for this, and the Jews did not like this. The, the Hebrew Christians, they, they, they felt like they, they've done way too much for this. They've sacrificed too much, they've given too much, and, and they drew the line right here where they said, I, I'm not sure if I'm willing to die for Jesus. Wow. Now we're asking for a little more than what I signed up for. And uh, the Hebrew author is actually encouraging them, actually what you've been promised is Jesus. And what you're going to get is Jesus. And this is all just part of the deal. That persecution is bound to happen. People will hate you for your faith. And so the, the whole premise or the whole point of the book of Hebrews is to convince the Hebrew Christians about how Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the only way. Yeah. Jesus is greater. And leaving the church, leaving Jesus, you're leaving the promise. So anyways, we're going to dive deeper into it today. I hope we're excited. On Wednesday night, we went through chapter 10, so we skipped 9. Now we're going to go back to 9 today. And then next week, we'll continue in chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the golden uh covered or the gold covered ark of the covenant this ark contained the gold jar of manna Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the covenant above the ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover but we cannot discuss these things in detail now when everything had been arranged like this the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry but only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year and never without blood which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance the holy spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. There's a lot that we, we, we just read here. 
And I know we all grew up Jewish, so I probably don't need to explain much to you on this regard. But here he's describing the tabernacle. So when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land, they traveled 40 years in the desert. And during those 40 years, they would worship God inside a tabernacle, which is really this enormous, huge tent. And when you go back to read this back in Exodus and Leviticus, you just read so much detail. He gives us a little bit right here. He says there's a place in the tabernacle called the holy place. And this makes up two thirds of the tabernacle. And this area is where the priests would come and do their responsibilities. Then the other third is what they call the most holy place. Mm -hmm. And the most holy place from the holy place was separated by a curtain. Because that's where the presence of God would dwell. And no one was allowed to enter that except for the high priest. Mm -hmm. And when he entered it, it was once a year. And he had to enter with blood. The reason why he had to enter with blood was to purify everything to cleanse everything see the, the the truth is that what is explained to the jews is judaism the worship that they used to practice and it was only external ceremonies it only cleansed the outside and that's very much what all of this was foreshadowing pointing to it, it was a symbolism it was allegory for what we have now that it is to show that that was not enough. That was not the way. That was not going to clear our conscience. Yeah. But what we have now is greater. Wow. I love what he says. He's like, man, there's so much more I can tell you, but we don't have time to go into detail right now. I mean, I'm already confused just from the little bit he did get. <laughs> Here's to know how much more he was going to get into it. But it is intense that when you do study at the tabernacle, and I like to encourage everybody to do so, uh -huh. to better understand that the Hebrew author's mind and the Hebrew Christians who read this letter, that, oh my gosh, everything literally points to Jesus. Right. And yeah. in a very, very simplistic way, right. what the Hebrew author is saying is all of this but was a copy of Jesus. Oh. Wow. Yeah. All of this was pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Every strand, every detail, everything was covered in gold. The mercy seat, the manna, the staff, the, the stone tablets, all of this pointed back to Jesus. Wow. It was all but a copy. You know, what are some uh, more modern day ideas with copies? Well, I can't help but think of a copy machine. You know what I mean? You, you write a letter and maybe you want to copy it. Well, you go put it in the copy machine facing down, and you got to make sure you get the right corner because if not, they come out, you know, a little off there. And uh, you hit how many copies you want. You want 10 copies, it'll come and print it out. But when you hold the copy next to the actual real letter, you can tell one's a copy, and you can tell the other one is authentic. It's the same idea that it, what he's telling the Jews. Judaism was a copy. It's not the exact authentic, authentic Worship of God. Oh, that is yeah. what Jesus brought. He brought the reality. Everything else is but a copy. Right. Another good example is uh, videography or uh, photography. Right. You take a picture of something of a moment or you record a moment, you can go back and reflect on it. That's awesome. But it's not like in the moment. Right. It's not like being there. Right. It's not like smelling the roses when you were yeah. at that park. It's not like smelling the burnt coffee when you were at that coffee shop. Is but a copy yeah. but the reality is a lot better yeah. it's way more awesome on, and that's bro. and very simple what the hebrew author is telling the hebrew christians wow. so therefore my title this morning is the sun is our reality on, the sun is our reality There are three areas the Hebrew author goes into detail about in regards to the realities that Christ brought to us. Let's keep reading here. Hebrews 9, verse 11. It says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Point number one, the real sacrifice. Point number one, the real sacrifice. He goes on to describe how for Judaism, how did they get sanctified? How were they able to enter the most holy place? Well, by the blood of calves and heifers and bulls and goats and all these things. So for Jesus being our new high priest, for Jesus, for that being a copy of reality, he too has to enter through a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And what did he sacrifice? But himself. Mm -hmm. He's able to enter the presence of God through his own blood. His sacrifice allows us to also enter the presence of God. Jesus is our reality. The blood of sacrificial animals were but merely a copy of this real sacrifice. He sacrificed himself to make himself a perfect mediator. He sacrificed himself to serve in the tabernacle called heaven. He sacrificed himself to provide you and I with freedom. Come on, Come on. Wow. Come on. Jesus Come on, is the real sacrifice. Yeah. Come on, bro. Now, you and I are called to be sons and daughters of God. Yeah. 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 So in a sense, we too are to be copies of the reality. Wow. So if Jesus is the real sacrifice then we are called to imitate, to copy and paste into ourselves that same heart of sacrifice. I want to ask you, how are you doing in your sacrifice? How are you doing in your sacrifice? Are we imitating? Are we copying the same sacrifice of our reality, Christ? So when I think of a sacrifice, I think of Independence Day. Here uh, in America, we had 56 men sign the Declaration of Independence. And what's quite interesting about these uh, signers is a lot of them went through a lot of hardship, a lot of sacrifice. <laughs> Give you some examples. 12 men had their homes ransacked and burned down to the ground. Two of them who signed lost their sons in the Revolutionary War. Two others also lost their sons uh, in the war who were captured as slaves. And nine of them also fought in the war and lost their lives in that Revolutionary War. They signed and pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor for the sake of having independence here in America. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what kind of men were they? Well, 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 of them were merchants. And 9 of them were farmers. Mm -hmm. These are regular men, regular people, Come on. who are willing to sacrifice for us to literally, physically have freedom in America. Yeah. Wow. Jesus himself also gave up his fortunes, yeah. his life, yeah. Yeah. his sacred honor in heaven to come down to earth. Come on, so true. 
And he signed his declaration of freedom for you. Not in ink, but in blood. And now he's trying to see who's going to be the next man and woman that will stand up and imitate and copy his same sacrifice. I want to challenge you to imitate his sacrifice and being willing to give up your fortunes, being willing to give up your lives, being willing to give up your honor. See, I, I think we are very much a church that believes in restoration. And restoration means that we're going to copy and paste the first century church today in the 21st century. Come on. And all these men sacrificed. They imitated. And I believe that that is who we are this morning. We are people that are going to be willing to wake up early. Get into our quiet times. Read our Bibles. Pray to the Father. We're men and women that will stay up late. And share our faith. Because we just want to get that one more Bible study. We want to see one more soul added to the kingdom. We are men and women that we're going to sacrifice financially. That right now, they, they announced how much they raised for special missions in the movement. We did not have a hand in that yet. Because we're a new established church. But just give us one more year. And we too will give to the movement special missions. We too will sacrifice and see many more churches planted around the world. We are men and women that will sacrifice our comfortability. We will sacrifice our opinions. We will sacrifice our emotions. We will imitate the sacrifice of Christ. Point number two. The real forgiveness. The real forgiveness. Let's keep reading here. Hebrews 9, verse 16. It says, In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is still living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. But when Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water and scarlet wool and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the Lord or this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep in the same way. He sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Mm -hmm. The real forgiveness. Jesus came down to earth to show and demonstrate real forgiveness. It's interesting that the word here, will and covenant, are actually the same Greek word. Nice. I talked about this last Sunday. I just want to remind you of that. As here, he now kind of has a, a little bit of a double meaning and switches sides from covenant to will. And he's describing how a will, when you write a will, it does not go into effect until you die. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, right? Yeah. It's called a will for a reason. You know, it's your inheritance. You get it after they have passed away. And so in the same way, this new covenant cannot go into effect until Jesus had died. Wow. And he had to die. He had to sacrifice himself. He had to give his blood for you and I so we can have forgiveness. And the Hebrew author explained this to the Hebrew Christians in regards, again, to Judaism. He's meaning them where they're at. He says, guys, in Judaism, everything has to be sprinkled in blood. All the people, the scroll, the most holy place, the holy place, the tabernacle, every, the altar, like everything is just lathered. It's lavished in the blood of all these different sacrificial animals. So in the same way, we too need to be covered in Christ's blood yeah. to have true 
real forgiveness. See, the, the real covenant brought forgiveness. And this real covenant cannot go into effect till Jesus died. I, I do believe, um, when I think of forgiveness, what comes to mind is, um, I, I've shared this video in the past, it, it, it's a, a three-volume series, you can find it on YouTube, actually, and it's called Human. And uh, Human Volume 1, you can find it in the first uh, couple minutes, it's it just interviewing different people, and there's this man who's just sitting in front of the camera, and uh, he's just talking. He's just talking. There's no real questions. There's no back and forth. It's just him talking to uh, the camera. And uh, he starts off by saying, um, he, he gives a date. He says, man, it was on this day where my life has changed. My life has changed forever. The reason being is because um, I, I, I met a woman. And this woman she uh, showed me something that nobody else has shown me. And she, she, she looked past my condition. And, and my condition is that um, I, 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 I committed murder. I committed the worst kind of murder. Since I, I, I killed um, a, a woman and her child, a woman and her son. And uh, she, she was willing to uh, still uh, have a, a, a relationship with me uh, in spite of that. Uh, but I have now a life sentence in prison. And uh, this woman is the mother uh, of the, the wife and kid who I killed. Wow. And uh, she showed me forgiveness um, even though I did not deserve it that by every means she should hate me, uh, she should not love me. She showed me what real love and real forgiveness is. And it just cuts off right there. It's such a, a moving interview. But I do believe that that right there is such a great illustration of real forgiveness. That the, the, the grandmother of the child, the mother of the woman, has every right to have hatred. Wow. Has every right to have bitterness, to reject, to not, not go out of her own way. But she was willing to visit this man and show him love and show him forgiveness because that is real forgiveness. I believe Christ has done the same for us. Come on, Eric. We, we ourselves, just to let you know, a lot of people in the religious world tend to look at the person to the right or left and say, hey, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. Right. At least I'm not as, as bad as that person out there. At least I came to church. At least this, at least that. One, they're shooting for mediocrity. But two, they tend to compare themselves to people and think that they're the standard. Right. 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 You, you should not, a copy should not Compare yourself to another copy. Yeah. We should compare ourselves to the reality, which is Jesus. But I, I do believe that for all of us, we must understand one thing. You're all murderers. You're all killers. It is because you sinned, Jesus had to come down to earth and die. Your sin did that. You killed the son. You killed our reality. But it had to happen to help you understand and know real forgiveness. <laughs> and though Jesus has every right not to leave his comfort in heaven, not to come down in flesh form, not to live a sinless life, all these things, he has every right. He did so anyways yeah. for you and I. Come on. Why? Because he is reality. He is real forgiveness. And I want to put before you that we must be a church that is just overly generous yeah. in forgiveness. Yeah. Oftentimes, I think it's so easy to want to argue facts and want to point out, well, but, 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 but bro, the, my, my roommate, I, I've told him many times to clean up his corner. He just he gives, piles up that laundry, man. I smell it from my bed. <laughs> 
Yo, skips laundry day. Oh. I keep telling him and telling him and telling him. At some point, right, I should like not tell him and just let him figure it out, right? At some point, maybe, maybe I don't have forgiveness for him. Because I've had enough of it. And I've drawn the line right here. You have to understand, who is he talking to again? The Hebrew Christians. Who do you think they're struggling to forgive? The Romans. Who are hunting them down. Chasing them. These people are literally killing their children. Just let, get, let me give you just a small snip into what they went through. They were lathered in cow's blood and thrown into lion's dens. Wow. They were drenched in oil and lit on fire. Wow. Some of them were crucified even upside down next to their wives. That's right. They went through so much. And what is the Hebrew author saying? Forgive. That's They're preaching. Jesus, the real forgiveness. Yeah. So we too must be imitators and copy and paste that same forgiveness. Because you too were in darkness. You too once were in that. Hey, bro, I hear you, but this sister, she was not in darkness. She was in the light. So she should know better now. It's called a sinful, sinful nature. Our flesh is always going to want to go to darkness. And you know what's going to overcome sin? Well, what does the Bible say? Love. How do you overcome evil? By doing good. And what is the good we ought to do? Have real forgiveness. Let us make a decision to forgive. It's time to put an end to that. Jesus himself, who is king, who is Savior, forgave us. I don't know about you, but the one that always hits me is that parable of the unforgiving servant. Right. Uh, I'm like, man, how dare I walk around not forgiving my brother or sister or even the non-Christians when Christ forgave me? Right. Yeah. Just to let you guys know, I'll let you in a little secret here. We'll talk more about it at a leaders meeting. But Gabby and I have gotten some uh, death threats, actually, a little bit recently. And you know what should be our heart towards that man who sent us these texts and made phone calls and whatnot? Forgiveness. It ought to be love. That's the type that we are to imitate. That is the type that we are to be. That is why you were called out of darkness into his light. So that you too can reflect real forgiveness. Very quickly, point number three. Real purification. Real purification. Hebrews 9, verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves are better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest, he, uh, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Real purification here it begins by saying that the jewish practices again had to be purified by the sacrificial blood yeah the all these things again are a copy of the real practices in the real worship 
And therefore, the real worship also needs purification. Not a fake one, not a temporary one, but a, a real purification. Yeah. And it would be one that, man, it would, would, would be for eternal. Come on, bro. It would be forever. Right, right, right. And he talks about how Jesus, he entered heaven not to be sacrificed over and over and over again for you. No, no, he was the real sacrifice. Yeah. If he had to be over and over, then he's just a copy. Right. But he's reality. Come on. So his one sacrifice was enough for past, present, and future forever. And it goes on to say that the people are destined to die and then to face judgment. Now, Jesus is fully God, yeah. but he's also fully man. Yeah. And therefore, Jesus came to earth once, and he died. So he's only, he's only going to experience death once. Yeah. But then when he comes back a second time, it's not to die for you, but it's to save those who have been waiting patiently. It's to save those who have experienced and sat in the real purification. On the other side of the coin, he's also coming back for judgment. To judge those who did not obtain and sit in this real purification. It's interesting, I found this um, little story online of a, a lady who was showing uh, uh, her kids this cool little concept with a cup of water. And she brought in dirt and uh, took a spoonful of dirt, threw it into the cup. And she's like, well, guys, how do we purify this water? How do we cleanse it? She was like, let me show you something. I, I can try maybe with a spoon and take all the dirt out. And she's trying and trying and trying. It doesn't really work out. She's like, you can do that. And you probably spend a, a long time trying to do that and get nowhere. Or you could just run it under a faucet of water. So she takes the cup full of dirt, puts it under the, the faucet of water, leaves it running, and eventually as the water goes in, it, it actually cleanses out the dirty water. And now it's purified. I believe it's such a great example of what it looks like to be Christians. That we were that dirty water. And we tried cleaning ourselves out with different things. We tried pretending that we were clean. We tried walking around like we, we had it together. We, we maybe put a sleeve around the cup to hide the dirtiness. But now as Christians, we get to sit under the faucet called the blood of Christ. And that blood is just running through you every single day to purify you to cleanse you, to make you holy, so that you can become the image of Christ. I want to put before you, to be purified through the blood of Christ, you got to grow in his grace. And you got to grow in his knowledge. And when you're constantly growing in the grace of God, you're constantly growing in the knowledge of who God is through his word you will find yourself purified. And you'll be able to be amongst those people waiting earnestly for when the real sun comes down and takes those to salvation. Let us close out in Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 1. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Let's go down to verse 5 real quick. It says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me, with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the school. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, uh, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. 
I've come to do your will. He sets, us, he sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here, the Hebrew author closes out this concept of Jesus being the reality. That he came down so that we could be saved once for all. That he is the real sacrifice. He is real forgiveness. He is real purification. Come on, Eric. Come on. There's nothing else outside of this yeah. that will give you that. Come on, Come on. Right. Right, You can right. find versions of it, yeah. but they're not realities. Right. You can find watered-down concepts in some other churches, right. but they're not realities. Right. You can try to pretend that it's not there and check out and numb out. On, but you can't run from reality. Eventually, reality always comes back and hits you. Right. Reality is the best gut check. Yeah. You can check out on that Netflix. You can go watch your anime. You can play your songs on repeat forever. But eventually, that radio will run out of battery. That TV will go to waste. Everything has an expiration date. And we will face the reality of the sun. So let us remember and embrace that the sun alone is our reality. Amen. Amen.